Hello, welcome to today's Daily Bible Reading. Thank you. If you're joining with me uh, again, I really appreciate it. Or if you're joining with me today for the first time, thanks for coming on the journey. It's not too late. If you start today, come with us through to the end of the year and then just go back and start where we started uh, at the start of the year. You will also do the 366 days or so that we'll be doing. I'm recording this in a leap year, so there's an extra day. Anyway. Let's pray, and we're going to have a look at 1 Samuel, starting at chapter 8. Father, we come to you now, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to us and guide us and lead us. Help us now, as we look at your word, to be shaped and formed by it. May our hearts be open and soft to what you want to do in our lives. Amen. Right, this is 1 Samuel, chapter 8. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second, Abiyah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, Obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers And to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, No. But there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. And now before we jump into chapter 9, couple of things I think we should really learn from. Firstly, Samuel was an incredibly godly man. He was a very godly man. We don't know the bulk of it because the, the, the Bible will often say, and he reigned 20 years. Well, I'd like to know what happened in those 20 years, but we don't know. So we go from seeing Samuel, the young boy in the, the, the tabernacle area, maybe 15, 16, maybe even younger, And now he's an old man and he has sons who probably have wives themselves. And this is the thing that we, I think we need to note. Samuel, it appears, had neglected his primary responsibility, which really was to be a father. And being a prophet really was sort of way down the list, really, in the scheme of things, because his own sons didn't know God and didn't walk in the ways of God. This is really really sad there are times in 
my ministry and in my, in my life when I recognized that not intentionally, quite unintentionally, I've been neglectful. Neglectful of my wife, neglectful of my children. And I've had to, even though I've got mounting pressures, mounting responsibilities and deadlines looming for the various responsibilities that I have, and I don't always get this right, but I learn lessons from this that say, take the time to show and give attention to my wife and my children. So every Friday, Kim and I go out on a date, every Friday. And it's an, it's an exceptional uh, time if we don't. And often that might involve a funeral that we have no control over or something like that. Or I might be interstate or even out of the country. But we will block that time out to go on a date. The other thing is uh, I've got one child left at home. I've got four children, one left at home. We have fairly regular contact with them still. And with my youngest, I have the opportunity to go into her bedroom at night as she's just read her Bible or just about to turn the light out and just talk about what she read and how was her day if, I, if we haven't already gleaned that all, already. And to, to try and give the, the attention, but not just attention, but directed attention, because as we've already seen, the scripture says that, that parents should teach their children the ways of God when they sit down, when they rise up, when they go out, when they come in. So God's to be a part of everything we do. And that's what I've tried to do as a parent. Don't always get it right, but I learn a lesson from Samuel indirectly that if a godly man like Samuel didn't get it right, I, very, I could very easily not get it right as well. So I've got to make intentional steps to make sure that I'm discipling my wife and my children. Come with me now, chapter 9. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalashah. But they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalom, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zaph, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes since he must bless the sacrifice, afterward those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. 
for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go, and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited who were about thirty persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, Put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it, and set it before them before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day, and when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel said to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Well, this is, this is a, an interesting a chapter in Israel's history because what we see is the passing of the baton. We see Samuel, the old man who's about to go, and we see Saul, who starts out as a humble man, become, well, we'll see in the ensuing chapters, but it doesn't end well unfortunately, and it's a, a sad uh, case, a sad indictment on people who often start well, don't finish well. It's going to be my prayer in a moment that we learn from this and that we all start, continue and finish well. So it's not just how you start, it's not even how you continue, it's how you start, continue and finish. We're now in Mark chapter 11, we're going to be reading two chapters, Mark 11 and 12. Then when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard it. And when they came to Jerusalem, he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
and he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw a fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And they came to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? Mm, they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Chapter 12 And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, huh, This is the heir, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because 
you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive their condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And there's the contrast between genuine spirituality and false spirituality. The scribes and Pharisees looked religious, they looked devout, but Jesus said their hearts were far from God. I wonder who the, the scribe or the Pharisee was who came to Jesus and was commended for being close to the kingdom. We're not told. Was it Joseph of Arimathea? Was it maybe even Nicodemus? We don't know. But there were some, as this indicates, some who were part of that upper echelons of Jewish leadership who actually heard, who listened, and who recognized who Jesus was. And it finishes here with this woman putting in two small copper coins which amounted to a penny. And Jesus commends her. Notice he, he doesn't, doesn't rebuke or condemn the whole system of giving. He actually sees it as a, a state, a condition, a measure of the condition of the human heart. And he says, this woman's heart was good. My hunch is that that woman went home to a surprise. I suspect Jesus ensured that she was well taken care of. That's my, my hunch, based on what we know about Christ already. Well, we see here that Samuel's own sons had not come to know God. They had looked religious, but they hadn't come to know God. We see the scribes and the Pharisees, many of the scribes and Pharisees in Christ's day, who also looked religious, but they didn't know God either. And then we see this poor widow who put in everything she had, and Jesus said, that woman, that woman, she knows God. Well, let's pray. Father, I pray that we would not only 
start our journey, start our day with you, we would continue well with you and that we would finish well with you and that, Lord, when you give us the gift of tomorrow, we would start that day well, continue it well and finish that day well. And, Lord, as you give us the gift of life, I pray that we would continue to live well with you and that we would finish our lives well with you as well. I pray, Father, you bless those who have shared with me now in this Bible reading meet their needs, cancel their debts and draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being a part of this journey. If you've got a question, leave it in the comments section. I'll try to get to it when I can. If you've got a comment, contribute it and um, I'll probably like it just to let you know I've seen it. And if you haven't already liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll see you tomorrow for our next Daily Bible Reading.